Now you've heard from Megan today, who talked a lot about managing the media, but what I have seen definitely in Christchurch and with the Reno disaster is where public information managers have come of age now as far as I'm concerned. We're not seen as those people that sit in the back room that fluffy up the press release and make sure that the controller gets approval. We actually do a lot more than that now. And I think the importance of what we do now has been seen nationally and it's now been seen internationally. So I just want to know who you are because obviously you know a bit about me. Um, first up, I'll say that hello there. I always like to put a nice little cute image in there. Um, that's the little blue penguins as we're about to release them from the Wildlife Recovery Centre in Tauranga following the Rena spill. Um, you have to be certainly wired for crisis, and I think that's really important about public information or any role that we are within EOC or within the SIM structure. People think just because you're technically very good that you're actually excellent in a crisis. Well, as we all know, that's not the case. It has to be about the person. It has to be about leadership and the role. So who are you in this room? Can I have a show of hands? Do we have controllers here? People are too shy to be controllers. Okay, that's good. Do we have um, any planning and intelligence managers here? Great. Logistics? Fantastic. Do we have engineers? Of course we have engineers. And scientists? We must have some scientists still here. No, Calvin and his team have done a runner. That's good. So really, but there's no one here from public information. Oh, actually, is there anyone doing public information? We've got two, one, two, three, four. No one else. So it's quite, been quite interesting coming to this conference to see who is actually here. There's um, not many in public information here. And maybe it's because the program didn't quite engage them. But to me, it's more maybe to explain if you are a controller or working within... EOC, using that jargon, or an ICC if you're working in another structure, but basically an incident command centre, the public information team is actually really important to you. And their main role, if I look at the guidelines that we have here from Ministry of Civil Defence, a public information manager is, or must, create a strong public confidence in emergency management, support public safety with public info, positively influence public behaviour, and manage public expectations. However, one thing that is missing, and obviously we are looking at the guidelines and trying to update them for all our PIMs, is actually protecting the controller and actually working for you and being your support, your advisor. So we are quite a crucial part now. We're not just the people that put out a press release. So public information has changed. And what has made it really successful is definitely the way we do things now. And again, Christchurch was the biggest example we've ever seen in this country. And Rena, um, again, even though it was a man-made disaster, had some elements that were similar. However, what makes public information really successful is the people, and I've touched on that. This is Prue and Jackie. They both work at Bay Plenty Regional Council. They helped me lead the community relations in the Bay when all of a sudden the community felt angered that Maritime New Zealand weren't doing anything. So that was one of our biggest priorities, was now, after day three when I arrived in Tauranga, we had to turn around the community vibe that people, we were actually doing something. Yes, there is going to be oil on your beaches, and how are we going to try and help clean it up? But these two people came from Bay Plains Regional Council. They were fantastic. They just work well in a crisis. They can cope with instruction. They're not going to ruffle feathers. They're engaging. They will go and talk to people and make sure you've gone to planning and intel and logistics and everyone's kept informed. And so the, what my big key is here is that public information, you might have 20 years' experience as a great journalist. You might have 40 years as corporate communications manager somewhere, but that doesn't mean it makes you an effective public information manager. You have to cope in a crisis. You have to keep everyone calm. You have to give strategic advice. You have to work a lot of long hours. And as we all know, if you are in leadership roles in an EOC or an emergency, it is about the leadership. You spend more time doing staff management issues and making sure everyone's informed rather than actually doing the real job. So the people make it successful. Whether you're a small council, I've come from Northland, which obviously we aren't lavish or rich and have lots of resources. This is though a standard structure that I implemented for public information in Northland. And you can have that too if you're a small organisation. As you can see, we've got the standard PIM role. We've, I've allocated a web and social media resource. We have internal communications, which people always leave out. You need to make sure your workforce are fully informed if you're running a local response within your council and other organisations. Call centre. There might just be two people. We only had three. That was our call centre. However, we had agreements with the Whangarei District Council and lots of others to try and take calls. And then lastly, admin. Again, overlooked for public information. 
All people really focus on is getting out the press releases, but there's so much stuff that we need to do. Out of all those areas, though, in public information, where I've added the three boxes are the ones that you'll need to grow the most. That's where you will need to bring other people in. And you can upscale quite quickly with that. We've been social media, they don't have to be trained people. They could be your policy analysts. They could be people who work in finance. But they're savvy, as we've heard before, in using social media tools. They're really easy. This is the structure we had in Christchurch for public information. You won't be able to read it all. There's been numbers banded around today, around 47, that would probably be around 47 to 55 people we would have on any one day in the public information team in Christchurch. However, that did not include Dave Daly's team who are running the call centre off-site. And then also, they, they just swelled and upscaled as well. So a really huge structure. And there's a couple of things that we did in Christchurch which I thought were really good. One was we introduced a thing called a PIM 2IC. So public information manager was always in meetings, always in briefings, always with John, round all over the place. They had so much to do. So we implemented public information manager 2IC, who was like an office manager. They were there, based in the centre, managing the team, being the liaison point when people came in and actually filtering, finding out what needed to be done and then tasking someone to do it. So that's really important because you will need a 2IC, as we all do, in all our different groups within an emergency. But the tools, so again, there are some sexy tools, which I think everyone loves to talk about now, which is social media, but it, again, it's only one tool. There are still lots of tools in our box. And obviously media, no matter what people think of them, because we've heard lots of comments today, and Megan has presented, media are our friend. And I will always push that, and I know Megan will too, and a few of us will, because to be honest, guys, media need, we need media more than they need us. And you guys, some people really need to realize that, it's not just about in crisis, it's when you're running your organisation. That's another story. But with media interviews, just some quick tips for people because they want it to be quite a, a learning session, is prepare. We've heard this before. Confirm and train your spokespeople before an event. That always helps because you need to work that out. You're going to have egos involved. There will be mayors, there will be CEOs, there will be councillors, there will be politicians, but you need to be very clear on who will be the spokespeople. And unfortunately for Christchurch, that had a dry run in September before the big one. And so pretty much it was very clear who was speaking on what topic, which really helped. Media tours. Now this is um, inside Rena, inside the old supermarket in Tauranga, if some of you were deployed there. We had up to around 200, 300 people working in that incident. We did do one or two media tours, one to the wildlife facility. We ran quite regularly to show the penguins being washed and another one to show the scale of the response that we were dealing with. And the reason why you run media tours is so people can understand. The media can start to see that they're not just all these people running inside this glass office. As um, Megan was saying, the media looking in and we were all having hot coffee and, and food and using portaloos in Christchurch, but there was a lot of work going on. But a message for media tours, or for any media response, you do need to do an accreditation process. In Christchurch, and unfortunately we did it again in Tauranga, we had a very secure site for our EOC. However, our passes were little photocopied notes that potentially were laminated. You had to carry your driver's license for photo ID. So again, the scale of Christchurch was large. We had a very large media contingent. Tauranga, we probably only had around 100. But again, what you need to do is ensure you have some sort of media process. And um, again, Megan is happy to share the media accreditation form for you. Press conferences, we all know about how good press conferences can be during a response. But some things people do miss now. You can film your own press conference as well. So have you got capability? Kevin's filming us. He's been filming the whole conference. You need to make sure, as an organization, there's someone there, whether it be the receptionist, someone in finance, someone who's really good at doing video, can you video our own press conferences and then put it online? Because what you're doing is, you're, as someone said before, I only got five minutes when the Royal Wedding was on TV. Well, if you're filming your own press conference and you're putting it up, you're leading. Um, the message and putting it out. And lastly, another thing you can do in press conferences, which people really miss, is live stream it. You can do it by doing live tweets, because people always say, oh, the Bay of Plenty Times, they got out first with the facts and figures for the number of dead birds we had um, at Rena. Well, why weren't we using Twitter? It's very easy. You, you can tweet as an organisation or a response live from the press conferences, just as the questions are being asked from the journalists. So you can also be there putting out messages. Fact sheets and adverts, 
really effective in Christchurch. Again, we had to go back to some very basic grassroots ways of connecting with our community. However, really enlightening to see, you all got a language line um, brochure, which is the f- a first. Most people had never even heard of language line. And I suppose some of you in the room hadn't either until you saw this and thought, oh, well, that's great. Hold back in your conference bag. These guys provide, and they're provided by the government. They actually will provide interpreters. We, as you saw, we had a lot of Mandarin, Hindi, we had Japanese, we had so many English as a second language speakers in Christchurch, but we could have used Language Line, and we did quite a bit. So again, that's another resource. Great to provide printed material during response, but please remember all your other languages. Community briefings, we saw a lot of that with Bob and Jim and Roger all going out, being chopped into community areas, giving an update about what the response was doing. We did the same thing in Tauranga with Rena, because we were a bit slow off the mark, obviously. On day six we started that, and that's when the anger was really high in the community. Obviously, it was very different to Christchurch. People were angry. There was a ship on the reef that was now leaking oil onto their beaches. What are you going to do about it? This is Catherine Taylor, for those of you who don't know. She's director, or was director of Maritime New Zealand. She was fantastic. We chose the right person to be out there. She, again, from the horse's mouth, She was a woman, as far as I'm concerned, a very strong, intelligent woman, so she had empathy with the audience, um, and she just worked really well. You need to have those sorts of people or leaders at community briefings. They want to hear what's going on. But some prep you can do, and some of you already got that anyway with your events teams and your organizations, prepare community venues. And not just ones that are obviously indoor, you need outdoor, and you need lots of backup sites. That's the stuff you can prepare before an emergency. Posters, they were really effective again in Christchurch. People needed to collect water. So again, it was about getting those posters out. So sounds like a great, neat idea. But again, some prep you'll need to think of is how will you design them, how will you print them, and how will you distribute them during a crisis. The press did a fantastic job. Um, That's a newspaper in Christchurch. They printed. They were still printing. They were still doing a newspaper. So we were still able to actually use some of those resources and some of our suppliers as well by Christchurch City to still design. We had marketing people inside the EOC laying out, printing, and organizing the distribution for us. So a real easy tool, but one that actually does provide and actually require resourcing. Mail drops, you heard from Sam and the team before. Again, great idea, but in the eastern suburbs, you couldn't use Reach Media, TMP, New Zealand Post, or any of the normal mail drop channels because they weren't going into the eastern suburbs. So again, you had volunteers. So the prep for that is for you all, and I think the other speakers have touched on it, build those links with your community groups, ones that are already there. Um, If you are going through community response plans, you would already have identified that, but if you haven't, It's something you can quickly do now before those response plans are put in place for those communities. Text alert for all networks. That was a a first for New Zealand during an emergency. Obviously, we were able to um, provide a text, which to anyone who who had been in Christchurch in four weeks before from certain cell phone towers, which still stayed up during the earthquake, and actually send out key messages in 140 characters. As you can see, it's quite hard to try and summarize some of that information. So what can you do? You can prepare by starting to think of what will be those key messages you want to give out in the 140 characters. And very much like social media, you don't need to use text speak. People want to actually, even though it was hard for us to put lots of stuff on there, it's always good to try and actually say things in full English if you can. Your call centre. So again, it was um, in both scenarios, Rena and Christchurch, the call centres were overwhelmed. They did a fantastic job. A lot of after hours and backup was used in Palmerston North by Palmerston North City Council's call centre. However, some prep you can do is I really do believe you need to look at what will be your after hours service when an emergency breaks in the middle of the night. If you have a local security company, if you're a small council looking after it, if you have um, Dorothy who carries it on a mobile and she just answers the phone, then you really need to make sure there is planning in place that if an emergency breaks or a tsunami warning, which is what we're getting now at two o'clock in the morning, you need to make sure you can quickly upscale your call center or flick over a switch and outsource to somewhere else like Palmerston North. And obviously another good thing is if you do end up getting into a big response, make sure you assign someone within the EOC or within your PIM team especially that just looks out for the call center because the call center is not normally based inside your command center. They're normally based off-site somewhere else and they can get forgotten. So really make sure you've got someone championing them inside your PIM team. And lastly, your website. 
So this is the North Region, it's really hard to see, but it's the North Regional Council day-to-day -day website. You know, nice glossy picture, come and live here, what we do, all that sort of stuff, news and features. But what you should do for your website to prepare is one, is it accessible anywhere, anytime? It doesn't have to be logged in on Doris's PC, who sits upstairs on the third floor in the middle of the CBD, that it can be web accessible. It's not reliant on your server, which is sitting inside your ground floor, which is in a flood zone. So you really need to make sure that your web presence does have backup. And people like Google as well can help you with the upscaling of that, because you might get a lot of visits. Another thing you can do is obviously network with your local development community. There are lots of people and geeks out there, if we were to call them, that who love to help. And you saw that with Anthony, with regards to Google Crisis, we saw it in Christchurch, with regards to the open data community. Those people are already out there, but do you guys know who they are, or who's the one go-to person you could go to? Open data community, you can get hold of Nat Talkington if you want a name, and he will put you into probably local people in your area that would be willing to help. They don't even have to come into the EOC. They could be off-site creating a a website, and making sure everything works for you. So make sure you build those links with your local development community, your local geeks, if you want to call them, and also the open data community, because they're prepared to help you take your data and release it. Put it in a graphic form, put it in all those different ways that Anthony was explaining to you yesterday. And this is our website, if I go back, sorry, this is our website now in crisis mode. Not that it looks very different, but actually it does. The whole front page changes, it's, it's briefly overviews, what the response is, all of these you can't really see, but it's changed to weather updates, this is a storm event, road closures, school closures, mail deliveries, um, all the news is, is specifically about it. So again, I've been banging on about this to public information managers for the last four and five years and web managers across New Zealand, and I would say around 75% of council websites now have the ability to flick on to some sort of civil defence status in a response, a local response, which is a good thing. We're slowly getting there. But some other things you can still do, easy to find info. If you still don't have that foxy website in an emergency, you really need to make sure that when people go to your homepage, they can find the information. Now again, a crisis doesn't have to be as big as Christchurch. You could have a workplace fatality. You could have a chemical spill. You could have something that really affects your staff, a gas leak. There's lots of things. If you're going into an emergency situation as an organisation, your homepage of your website needs to reflect that. We're in control, this is where you can find information, just like you would if you were fronting up to the media. And we're doing for time. And lastly, with a website, that's the only down thing. Just because we go to sleep doesn't mean the rest of the world do. There are shift workers in our cities as well. People still need to find that information. So again, you need to make sure you can update it. I say 16 to 18 hours, people do need to have a break, and obviously you would still have a roster. But again, with a website, you need to have that continual presence. This is Maritime New Zealand's. One thing we did really well with Rena as well, we provided an image gallery, and most websites do do that now as well during our emergency response to help deal with queries, people to see updates. Rena, and very much like Christchurch, you couldn't go into the red zone, there was a no-fly zone over Rena, so we had to provide high-res images online that the media could use and pull, or otherwise the community could also use. But lastly with Rena, another really good thing we did was an incident timeline. So what you would have is journalists coming in and out, you'd have people coming in and out of the EOC, lots of information requests, how did the response, how did, how did this happen? You could refer them to the website because there literally was an hour by hour incident timeline from when we first started the RENA response. Another prepare, we've touched on it before, you've heard from Anthony, make sure you are aware about Google Crisis or your web teams are, they need to be aware of them, and again your open data community. So social media, the last thing I'll just go on about before I get kicked off the stage by Clive is social media, which a lot of people have touched on today and yesterday. Twitter is number one, and it's number one in emergencies. I'm just gonna quickly take you through what you can do on Twitter. This isn't just saying use it, I'm gonna tell you the things you should be doing on it. You can't really read this. No confirmation of a tsunami has been generated by Vanuatu earthquake. However, a potential advisory threat remains. That was in 2009. We'd had the Samoan tsunami, we then had the Vanuatu earthquake and everyone was in high panic mode. Ministry of Civil Defence and most councils weren't even on Twitter in 09. So what we did is, little old Northland, we just put that out. 
We've got 16 clicks directly from that, but a total of around 13,000 clicks went through to that link, which was the Ministry of Civil Defence homepage, which had the advisory on there. So again, one little tweet from Whangarei does spread. So there is the power of Twitter. It's got great reach. You can release tips and facts on Twitter. Twitter is the community, if you guys don't know that, they literally thrive on statistics. We want facts, you know, the stuff that Megan mentioned, all those bullet points before, how many press releases, how many briefings. I put that out on Twitter and it just keeps getting retweeted. People love facts and figures. That's what you should be doing during a response. Responding to queries. You also heard how the call centers were overwhelmed, but that happened with Rena as well. So what we could do is start responding and using Twitter as a customer service channel. But that should be your normal business anyway. Twitter isn't just about putting out messaging. As a council, that's what I push, is you should be using it for customer service. Going behind the scenes. So in peacetime, if you're running an exercise, 99% of the population want to know what an exercise is. They'll think it's star jumps. But as you know, you could pull together a number of people and be doing some amazing things. So what I would do is literally do live reporting at our exercises, taking photos of what we were doing, reporting what's happening. You just assign someone to do it, and it tells the story that civil defense or your response is, react is proactive, we're trying to plan, and we're training as well. Ask for help or ideas. This is really hard for people to do sometimes because we're meant to be in control, but there's no harm in asking for help, and that's what you can do on Twitter. Please help retweet messages about tsunami warnings. Always a popular thing to people want to do. And again, when you're looking for someone, lost property, we're looking for a tractor to go to Waimakakamukau to tote, pull something out, can anyone help? Again, resources and logistics could start using Twitter as well. And you can thank those that help. Of course, we can't thank everyone, as we've heard about all the people that would love to thank from Christchurch and also from Reno. But what you can do is you can personally acknowledge and thank people online. You can monitor feedback. So again, we're getting some good feedback from some people. Christchurch City launched Twitter to, um, not long after the, the February quake because there was no presence. And the idea behind it was to try and be a single source of truth. But we were starting getting great feedback. Whoever's managing the accounts doing a great job. Speed records doing very well. Alerts us to problems, obviously, but a uh, extremely nasty pothole on Hills Road, right lane into Shirley Road. Unfortunately, for the amount of information we're getting in, this is all, you know, lovely utopian stuff, but we were getting so much information in, trying to filter that and then give it to intelligence that actually was some sort of form. But again, they were getting it from phone calls, they'd get it on Twitter. So again, you can prepare by looking at how we manage all these bits of information coming in, which I'll touch on at the end. You can also track unofficial sources, I call it. This is the unofficial Rena Twitter page. You won't be able to read it again. MV Rena likes carrying cargo, calm water, dislikes rough seas, underwater rocks. Currently stuck on Astral Air Brief. So again, you can also track those unofficial things while people are saying. Event hashtags, for those of you who don't really know, hashtag is the hashtag on your key. And then also you can add EQNZ, which stood for Earthquake New Zealand, CHC for Christchurch, and Rena was R-E-N-A, hashtag Rena. So we could track and download every day all the posts on Twitter about Rena. So is it just being a twit? This is just us talking about it. This is a real life example. In the Herald it was, and also in the press, Michelle Gooley and Kaiapoi after the quake happened back in February, couldn't get hold of her father. So she, put, she rang her sister in Auckland, who then rang her brother in San Francisco, who then put something on Twitter. Does anyone live, um, where is it, does anyone live near Opawa, trying to get hold of my dad? Some guy replied on Twitter, yes, what's his address? He told him, he went to the house, his father was sitting in the car outside, and he tweeted back and said, your dad's safe, I'm sitting with him now. And he sat with that, with that guy for two hours until Michelle could get there from Kaipoi, because obviously the roads were damaged, there was rubble everywhere. So again, Twitter isn't just about great, quirky people that love to do messaging, it actually does have real life effect. Facebook, I'll just quickly touch on Facebook because I think we've touched much about it. This is Wellington Emergency Management Office. What you can do in Facebook is build one now. If you don't have one, you build a presence in peacetime. You build that community. And also what you can do during a response is allow people to have their say. Because a lot of people just want to complain or let out their frustrations. So if they can't get a phone operator, let them do it on Facebook. There's no limit to characters or the amount of words they can use. So again, let them do that. Also, we use this in Rena. Um, we created one for all wildlife response. 
And again, it was to profile raise different parts of the response. So people could see that it wasn't just about Maritime New Zealand doing stuff. We had these great vets, these great marine biologists who all come together to run the World Wildlife Response Unit. And the other great thing about Facebook is it doesn't have to be managed inside EOC. They can be managed outside in a little office at someone's home as long as they've got a good data connection. And then obviously there's the fun, you know, Jeremy. I think he actually, you know, it's a bit old that one, 25,000 likes for Jeremy, the hot sign language guy. So Jeremy Borland did very well um, out of Facebook as well. More popular than the student army, I'm sorry, Sam. So, turning to YouTube. Lastly, YouTube again, the great thing about YouTube, prepare it, build up your channel now. If you don't know how to do it, go and ask someone, do an email to all staff, someone will be able to know how to set up YouTube, and just keep it there. You don't have to promote it or use it, but again, it's a channel that's already set up. You've saved yourself another 25 minutes, potentially, in creating YouTube. Then, what you need to do is share the footage. So obviously we did it with Christchurch, with the Red Zone, with Reno, we did lots of shared footage. We also put up all the press conferences, and really great for technical instructions. I think the most popular viewing on the YouTube channel for Christchurch was Bob Parker explaining how to use a chemical toilet. Again, we all laugh, but it was something that was really hard to explain. The instructions were not very clear, so a lot of demo helped. And lastly, with social media, you need to monitor it. So these are all the things that we monitored in Christchurch and Arena. Trade Me Community was one of the biggest, and then you create topics and trends, emerging issues, and we'd provide a daily report to planning and intelligence. So again, that takes time. So think of how you will monitor social media, and lastly, there is some guides coming soon. So lastly, what I will say with social media is resource it well and always have a policy. And why I say that is there were leaks all the time. It started in Christchurch, um, and I won't say what team it was, but we, we quickly found out which team was actually live tweeting, putting out on Facebook what they were seeing. They were putting out statistics and facts that hadn't been confirmed. It was unverified. So my, my thing, and the same thing happened at Reno, we had to close down a blogger. Some of you might have read about it. We went to the front page of the Don Post and of the Herald because he was one of the um, seamen on board the tug that was holding on to Reno. And he was giving very explicit views of what the salvers were doing um, or what they weren't doing sometimes because it was so dangerous. So again, you should have a policy about how will you manage social media in an emergency response. It's very important. So lastly, my lesson, sorry, what have I learned? Lesson one, just touching on that, regularly remind people about confidentiality. It's something that happens, you should do it at every briefing and every handover. Here's one of our briefings and handovers. Lydia and I would quickly remind people again about social media policy because that was something we had to say. You cannot tweet or put any posts out or just contact anyone about any facts or figures that you're hearing inside this room. And we all know that, we all sign up. But again, if you're bringing people from lots of different sectors who've never worked in an incident command center, they have no idea that the information that they're hearing and seeing cannot be told. It must stay in the ICC unless it's verified. What I do say in a policy is what you can do is you can talk about your role, but not about what you are hearing and seeing. It's completely confidential. Keep social media outside approvals. That's nice and easy. Your PIM or your social media team, if they're really savvy, will take information from your press releases anyway, which are already signed off by the controller. So again, we saw that. John's a very busy man. We weren't going to go with every tweet and post. John, should we say this? Should we say that? He quickly delegated that and said, no, you guys can look after that. So again, keep that out of the controller. Monitor, monitor, we've touched on that. Respond and then monitor. Avoid spam. Something really horrible happened, some of you would know about, obviously. McDonald's did a little tweet during the whole Christchurch quake and said, Shaky Town Christchurch, should we have a McDonald's? Head office didn't know about it. It was set up by another McDonald's in Auckland. So again, that was quickly shut down. Focus your social media channels. You only need to do three. Here's Calvin, one of our web guys. So again, three things he would focus on, Powerade, water, kids' drinks and, and calcium, that's all I think we had that day. Um, however, YouTube, Twitter and Facebook are the three channels you only really need to focus on during an emergency. USB sticks, your friend, you all know that, we all carry them with our templates. Sophie and Ross from Maritime New Zealand would all run around with our lovely USB sticks, plugging them into laptops because we never had a network. Use something old, something new. Again, a good old whiteboard, nothing wrong with that. And also text messaging. Think about your audiences. You've got Jeremy, we all know what a great job him and Evelyn did throughout the response, they were fantastic. 
and prepare. I mean, it's something that we all bang on about, but public information managers especially, you need to prepare for the ultimate problems. And lastly, you need to have some fun because you either got to laugh at things and have a bit of a smile, or you're going to have a breakdown. So you just need to have a bit of a laugh now and then to let off those frustrations because you will get there. And lastly, sorry, before I end, just wanted to say there are guidelines being produced. So Greater Wellington, uh, the Wellington Regional Civil Defence Group have received funding to create social media guidelines in a crisis. A few of us are on that working group. We will have a draft hopefully coming out soon to everyone. So again, it's about using social media only in a crisis. It's not about peacetime, but there are guidelines coming soon, which then the ministry will be promoting as well. Thank you. Thank you.